Uh, all right, welcome to lecture 18. Uh, before we begin, we had this, like I made this announcement last week uh, and I'm sure like everybody received this email, but I still wanted to go over that. And because we didn't have a spring break this semester, we are planning not to have a lecture on Thursday. And because we had lab, lab nine planned this week, and that is on classes, which we are going to cover today and on the next in the next lecture. Uh, so obviously I couldn't release this lab uh, right away. So this lab will be released next week. And so as a result, we have one lab that's less than like the usual count that we usually have, which is 11. So that is going to be optional. And just to make it clear, there, this optional is not for extra credit. It's there if you want to, if you're interested in it, go ahead and solve it. Uh, if not, it's just there, right? So, to, so in, in all, we'll have like 10 labs um, because there is no lab this week and there is no lecture on Thursday. Now, in, why like instead of having a break today, I decided to have it on Thursday. That's because today we'll be introducing object-oriented programming, which is usually, I would say, difficult to understand initially if you're like looking at, looking at it uh, the very first time. So once I've introduced it, go ahead, practice, go and look at it again. And so that will make like things uh, easier. Most likely in the in the next lab, you, it'll, it'll be easier for you to like kind of solve that. So that was the that's the plan. Uh, the other thing that uh, I want to talk about was the exam. And so exam two is being graded as of now, and most likely we'll release the grades by Wednesday. That's the goal. Uh, but if not, then latest by Thursday morning. So let's see. Uh, as as soon as like we're done grading, and as soon as I'm done. Uh, looking at uh, the grades and like releasing them also takes some time because like I have to go and check uh, almost every exam. So most likely will be done by Wednesday night. So of course I'll make an announcement when we release the grades. Uh, all right, so let's begin with today's lecture, which is lecture 18 classes and this is classes part one. So this is the first lecture on object uh, oriented programming. So this is the first one in which we are looking at creating our own objects, right? Until now, we've seen so many Python objects. Like anybody remembers what all objects we've seen until now? Nobody remembers any objects? All right, so Rochelle, you're saying strings, lists, tuples, images, excellent, yes. So we have looked at those Python objects and think of those objects as, as um, things that were created already when, when we installed Python, right? And we just like use them. So from today onwards, what we'll be doing, especially like with this classes, um, is that we'll create our own class, right? And so the question arises, why do we need to create our own class, right? We have like sufficient classes already existing for us, like lists, strings, integers, floats. And of course that's true, but then there comes this, this level of abstraction that we need to provide in our code, right? And why is that? Uh, well, now an object is nothing but like a representation of some data type of some real world object rather. And let me show you some examples. For example, how would you think of like representing a date in Python? How would you represent date? Because date is something like, let me write this down. All right, so date is like, for, for instance, let's say you can say four, five, 2021. So that's today's date, right? And how do you think we can like, what are different ways of like representing it? Uh, if you're like trying to save it and use it as well. So how would you do that? Well, one option is let's say a string. I can just like create a string and uh, save it, right? But then let's assume I want to use it somehow later on. I want to use the day, uh, the month, the day and the year for some other um, problem, for some other, computation and so one way is to create an object of the type date right and so what will have what that type will have and and of course well, the type should have like the the month the day and the year right and if you give me the month the day the year i should be able to create that date type right similar to that what about time Right, I can definitely represent it like as a string where I'll just say, okay, the time is uh, 10, uh, 15 a.m. 
but it would be definitely more convenient if I had a time object. So what will happen is uh, I have this object wherein I'll just like go and say X is my time, right? And just like, create. so this is like similar to what we do with strings as well, like strings or lists or or anything. What you do with a, with a list, let's say, is that you say, create this object of type list, right? And this list has certain properties. And these properties will quickly go into my S, my new variable. And then I can apply all those properties to my variable, right? So this list is a built-in type. I would say a built-in type or a class, as we shall call it from today onwards, right? So, or it's a class. And all we have to do is like simply go and create it and we are using it. So now we are going inside this class and see how exactly we create it. Uh, for instance, like, and this is the example that we'll be looking at throughout. So this is like a point class. So what is a point? A point is like in a two-dimensional space in X and Y. Of course, I can represent it as a tuple, right? Of course, I can represent it as a string. So there are like ways, or, or I can create it, a, like create a, a list of only two elements, and I can represent my point. But then maybe, maybe I need some more functionality to my point in the sense that uh, if I'm given two points, I should be able to add them. If I'm given um, if, if I'm given a point, I should be able to find the distance from the center, and there should be methods for that, right? Let's say I need a method that always computes, given a point, that always computes the distance of the point from the center, right? So basically from zero, zero. Uh, of course, like we can write a function for that. Well, that's doable. But what happens if I have like huge amounts of data that, that deals with this like point? two-dimensional point. So one convenient way is to go and create an object for that, right? That represents a point only. So I don't have to care about like a tuple or a, or a, or a list. I just know that my, my object point has like this X and Y and just like go ahead and use it, right? So that's like high level idea of what we are going to do. Basically like to put it in very concise terms, an object should have a representation and then you should have a way to interact with it. Right? So what should like an object have? And so these are another other examples that you might want to think about, like what should a student have? Let's say I'm creating a student object. It should have like some kind of a data representation. So these are the important points now. Data representation. And the second thing that it should have is interaction. For example, what does this data representation means? Well, if I'm creating a student object type, right? And let's say RPI wants to create a student object type. So we'll have like their name, right? And maybe some form of ID, and then maybe GPA, courses, and other things. Things that represent the student class, right? So that's my data representation. For example, in my two-dimensional point that we were just like talking about, my data representation was the X and the Y values. Right? So similar to that, the other thing that we always require when we are creating objects is the interaction. So it might not become super clear as of now what interaction means, but think of lists or strings. Right? I said that string is an object type in Python. A string has certain like methods associated with it, right? So those methods, for example, dot count, dot find, dot, dot split, and other things, right? They help me interact with my object. Right, so this is what interaction means, the methods that I'll create. All right, so whenever I'm creating an object, it, it should have like these two things, data representation and interaction. Data representation is nothing but the attributes that define that object. And the second thing is interaction. Interaction has, are nothing but methods or functions that you will use to interact with that object. Okay. So if we want to really define what an object is, right? And of course, like we have seen objects before. And so if we really want to define an object, it is a data abstraction that has a representation in the form of data and it has interactions. So always remember these two points, maybe note them down. The important like aspect of any object is that you can represent it through some data. And the second thing is that you can interact with it through some methods or some functions. And we have seen enough of those uh, built-in Python objects, for example, strings, lists, sets, right? Every, each one of those has a data representation and they have methods using which we interact with them. So when we start creating our own objects, we will do the same. 
Uh, all right. So this is an example from the earlier semester. Remember when we were working with the Yelp data? And let me put some, write this down. And uh, we wanted to, I, I remember one of the problems was to like use Yelp data and calculate the average uh, ratings for each restaurant. And of course, now we know how to parse the files and we, we wrote a parser where we were like remembering the indices of the restaurant name, latitude, longitude, type and all, and then working with that, right? So I had to like explicitly go ahead and check the index of each element and then work with that, right? And then like form a separate list of the ratings and so on. So one way of like making that problem easier, right? Is to create a restaurant object. Right, so once I've created a restaurant object, it will have these attributes. For example, the name, the latitude, the longitude, type, etc. right? And so if I create a function that has some way of just like reading those values and creating these restaurant object types, right? Then all I have to go like do is just like quickly go in and, and fetch, I would say the, the, the ratings, if I need the ratings the location directly because like my object type is allowing me to get those values, right? Directly get the ratings and then do the calculation. Directly get the location and do something with it. Or directly get the type and do something with it. Because I will have like every line of my file created as a restaurant object type. So I don't have to then like later on if I want to do something with it, I don't have to like remember the indices in my original file. So this is a very good example of why we create our own objects because like the question you might be like asking yourself is we already have enough right in terms of like integers floats um, lists strings tuples right and, and we are like able to solve almost all problems but then going forward you will see that sometimes it's more convenient to create your own class because it makes your life so much easier in terms of like making complex things simpler okay so that was an overview of what object type in Python means and an example to kind of demonstrate that. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is our first example and let me go to spider and directly do it here. Okay, so this is the first time we are writing our own class and this is how you do it. So class is a keyword. So the moment you type class, it's like change, like different color. That means it's telling you it's a keyword. It has a special meaning and then space you will decide the name of your class. And so what we are doing in today's lecture is we are building this two dimensional point class. The example that I talked about, like the X and the Y coordinates, right? So I'm creating a class for that. It's a very simple class that's representing a point in two dimensional space, right? So let me write it down, point 2D. I'm naming it point 2D. You can name it anything. So this is up to the uh, programmer up to you what do you want to, to name this class i'm naming it point 2d all right okay so this is optional now in python 3 it was required earlier but this is optional but i i usually like to write this here explicitly because this like when you are starting to build classes it, it is more convenient to write that keyword object okay so then the question arises what is the meaning of that right okay so i think i should uh, write that down here uh, even if you don't write it, it will still, if you just like skip this part, right, it will still create an object. That's fine. But what this is telling me here is that this is like, this is known as the most basic type in Python. This is the most basic type in Python. What does that mean? That means it is the parent class for all other classes that exist. So first of all, it's the most basic type. Second is it's the parent class for all other types. Okay, what does parent class means? Well, everything, like every object that either exists as a built-in object, right? Or the objects that we create, they will inherit certain basic properties from this object type, right? So it's always there. Even if you don't like explicitly put something there and you just like have like point, class point two d and that's it, right? Still, by default, there are certain properties of this class that will be inher inherited from this parent class because there are certain basic things that we don't really want to get into as of now, right? So we don't get into those. Those are like some existing 
uh, methods, those are some existing maybe operations that we always need for every object, right? So there is no need to like write and rewrite them from, from like scratch. They already exist, they come with the Python installation and my class is going to also internally um, extract that from my object type, right? So that's why we need that. And it's usually a good convention to use that object term there. Even if you don't use it, your class will still be created and it will still inherit like the properties from the parent class. Uh, all right, so that's it. And I'm writing this uh, keyword pass. Uh, this signifies that, uh, of course, there is nothing in this, but still it's like a valid class. You can also use that keyword pass sometimes in functions when you are like, you just thought about like, uh, the name of the function but you don't have like a clear idea of what to write inside it right so you can write like function and then pass and that just tells python that there is nothing in it as of now but still uh, this exists right so this is the first class that we have created and it got created of course right as you can tell we didn't get any error and of course this is not very useful because it doesn't have anything in it right and all it has is like the definition of the class and then this parent class, also sometimes known as the super class. So if somebody refers to you as like, uh, this is the super class and object is a super class in, in Python, right? And point to D is a subclass of that uh, parent class. And why are we emphasizing so much on this parent child relationship? That's because sometimes we will create our own classes, right? Such that uh, let's say I have this point 2D that has certain properties, right? And then I want to write point 3D. And then I don't want to repeat things. So I can make point 3D a subclass of point 2D or point 2D a subclass of point 3D, either ways, whichever works. So that's why we are emphasizing so much on this like parent child relationship because like this parent will give its properties to the child. All right. Okay, so this is my point 2D uh, class. And as I said, it has nothing in it. So obviously we need to put something in it. And before putting anything in it, we have to think about two things again. So if you remember, I said, and by the way, let me just check if there are questions because I'm just like talking and talking and I haven't checked any. Uh, all right, I don't see any questions here. So that's fine. Maybe now when we start creating the methods, you'll have questions, which is absolutely okay. So here, when we, whenever we start creating a class, right, there are two types of attributes. So just like we said, like in, oops, what happened? Okay, so in like an object definition, the first thing that we said was, the first thing was data representation, right? So in order to have data representation, depending on whatever we are trying to do here, right? These are known as data attributes. So we have to create certain attributes, right? So the first thing that we need is data attributes, right? Which will represent my point 2D class. For example, if this is like a two dimensional point, what do you think is the data representation for this? What do you think is the data representation for a two dimensional point? Yeah, excellent, Rochelle. What you said is correct, so this is like X and Y. This is my data representation because I need those two things. Maybe not with the, the like tuple type brackets, but like, okay, X and Y, at least I need those X and Y. So that's my data representation. Okay, and then the second thing is the attributes that correspond to any method. So technically speaking, they are known as procedural attributes. So procedural attributes, so this is my like, uh, interaction. Remember the second uh, important aspect of any object is the uh, interaction part. So the interaction part is procedural attributes. Okay, so what are these procedural attributes? These are nothing but methods or functions, right? And let me like uh, restrict myself to calling them methods because whenever some function is related to a particular object, we call it a method, right? Uh, so essentially a method is nothing but a function that works with this type only, right? And this is telling me how can I interact with an instance of my class, right? For example, we can find distance from the origin. For example, we can find distance between two points, right? All of that is telling me how can I find, how can I interact with my object? Uh, all right, so we will like throughout this, we will focus on these two. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, of course, I need data representation because after data representation only, I can add methods because the methods are going to work on that data. Okay, so let's go back. 
And as I said, we need something here, right? So let me add something, uh, which is uh, have like some utility to this point 2D object. It doesn't like really seem uh, as useful to me. And so in addition to what we have, I'm, all, I'm also importing math. So let me do that because I'll be using the square root. Remember the distance of one point to another is the square root of the square of X and Y. So that's why I'm importing uh, square root only. So from math, import SQRT. That's all I need for this one. And let me show you something here that what is this instance of my class that I was talking about, right? Uh, also, like even before jumping into the instance of my point 2D class, let me show you this. So when I'm doing this, okay, so what have I done here? What exactly am I doing when I say S equals this? Okay, anyone? What exactly are we doing here? Okay, because I don't see any answers, so I'll just like say that. Caesar, you're, you're right. So we are creating a string type. Alexandra, you're also right. So we're creating a string type. Now, I already said that Python has this object type that's a string, right? So if we really go into the technicality of this, we are creating an instance of string type. And that instance is my S, right? So when I said S equals this, it, it, it created this instance of S. And why is this known as instance of S? Because like if I do an S dot, then I get all the methods that are applicable to this instance, which is of the type string, right? So the same rule applies here. I have created this point 2D object, right? And I can create an instance of this by saying P equals point 2D and that's it. Let's see. Okay, so this is an instance of this class, right? And I can utilize the methods that this has to kind of uh, do what I want to do. So let's say I want to create or find the distance of this point from some uh, origin, which is zero, zero, right? And so of course, like if I want to calculate the distance of this point P, I need my X and my Y, right? And one way to do that is that like I can do a P dot and notice like, first of all, even before going there, notice like all these methods that are already there. And we'll see many of these today. These like these are special methods because these have like these underscores with them, right? And these underscores tell us that all these methods have been inherited from like my object type, which was the parent class. And these have special meaning, each one of them. Most likely they exist for all object types in Python. All right, so these are already there, although we haven't done anything in my point 2D object, right? But in addition, I want my X point and my Y point. So one way of doing that is that I can just like specify that directly here and say my X value is 10, right? And my Y value is, I don't know, five, right? And then I can calculate the distance from uh, the origin by simply doing like uh, the square root of uh, P dot X because it has this value, right? Uh, squared plus, P dot y squared. Uh, all right, let's let's try doing this. Right. Okay, so it is giving me this value, right? Um, and like everything looks okay here, but we might be wondering, like, if we if we are really interested in creating these kind of assignments and these kind of variables for my instance right, then this doesn't really make a lot of sense because I can make mistakes here. For example, I could have like created another instance, for example, Q equals a point uh, 2D and then said, okay, Q dot X is something. And then just like created this like square root kind of thing, this, this expression essentially. And maybe I forgot like to assign uh, my Q dot Y, right? This could be one example. Another could be that like maybe, uh, I don't know how many times I can, can I make this assignment? This is like a representation of a two dimensional point. And if I go ahead and do a P uh, dot Z, it will still allow me to use that, right? So these two issues sort of like point us to the fact that we need something inside my class that defines these points and not like 
explicitly going and assigning them because it just doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? Of course, I have like an instance of my point 2D class, but that's not really affecting my overall um, like the solution to this problem. I need something that's already there in the class and so, such that I can access it, right? So that's what we are going to do. We are going to create uh, these variables within my class. And there's this nice example in the lecture notes. Uh, okay, so we already talked about this. Um, yeah, so this is like how we can create a variables inside. All we have to do is like go and assign these. Like um, I can say x equals zero, y equals zero. So every time I create an instance of my point 2D class, it will have like these attribute values x and y, having like uh, initialized equal to zero. So this is actually telling us that we can go ahead and create these variables within my point 2D class, right? However, however, we have like this special initializer, I would say, or a constructor, which is it's already also known as constructor, that is used for all classes uh, to create this these um, initial variables, right? So basically what we need to do is we need to define our own data attributes in an initialization function or the init method. So let's look at what that is, right? So, oops, spider. All right, so this is the first data representation or my data attribute that I'm creating, and I'm creating it inside this special method called init. Now, going forward, whenever you are uh, creating your data attributes, it has to be created inside this init method, right? And let's look at like what this looks like. First of all, this is, even before writing the code there, this is a built-in method. I don't know if you noticed when I was doing like a, like even before creating that, if I was doing a p dot, right? And just scroll down, uh, you will see this init method already there, right? So the underscore underscore actually signify that this is already inherited from the object, like the parent class, and we can use it in a certain way, right? So this is the first special method that we are using, right? And it's used to initialize data variables. Whenever you, you will be defining your own class and creating your data attributes, you must use the init class. And that's important because when you create the instance of your class, you can directly use the data attributes there instead of like uh, unnecessarily like creating these uh, variables outside of your class. Okay, so let me show you what I'm, I'm talking about. So this is how we create the, how we initialize the data attributes. So that's like def underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And the first word is always self, right? And then you can have like the attributes that you want in your class. So for example, I want an X and a Y, right? And I, I'm simply defining them as like X zero and Y zero. And this is the input that the, that the user is going to give whenever they are creating this instance of your class. Okay, it seems like overwhelming. Just uh, let's stop for a minute and think about what, what is happening here, right? So. The first parameter in this init function is self. Self is a keyword, first of all. And this is just like, a, think of this as a placeholder or a parameter that represents a specific instance of your class. For example, one instance could be P, another instance could be Q. Whatever instance you will be creating whenever you're calling this object, right, that is, what self is representing. So basically the object is passed to itself. And that should always be the very first uh, argument in all the functions that you create inside the class, right? The other two could be anything and there is like no restriction on like not calling them X or Y. You can definitely call them X or Y. I'm just calling them X zero, Y zero to differentiate them between like internally um, calling the the definition of like X as like X and Y, but you can definitely create like X and Y, right? And then see what you have to do. You have to initialize them inside your uh, init function. So the question arises, how do we do that? Well, we do that by using this self, which is representing any one instance of your class and doing a self dot X. So now notice, instead of doing like P dot X and P dot Y, I'm defining that, uh, initialization here and I'm saying cell dot x equals x okay what does this mean equals x so it is corresponding to this x 
And there is no restriction on what you name these. So that's why I was like naming them X0, Y0. If I've named them something different, all I have to do is just like go ahead and do an self.x equals uh, x0, right? And self.y equals y0. What this is telling, uh, like internally, it's telling the class that look for a data attribute x that belongs to this class. And then look for a data attribute y that belongs to this class. And that's it, right? Let's just like stop here and see what difference that has it made to my initialization for like, creating my instance. Okay, so let's like create this. Uh, Caesar, that's a good question. You're saying why not self x0 equals x0? Internally, I want to refer to my variables as x and y. You can go ahead and do a self dot x0, whatever works for you. You can definitely do that. That's what I'm saying. Like there is a lot of like um, flexibility there. Rochelle, your question is, so x and y are not local variables. No, X and Y belong to my class. So I'm not sure what you mean by local variables and global vari variables here, because everything that I'm creating within my class refers to my class, right? Uh, Caesar, I'm not sure what you meant by looking messy. Uh, yeah, initially it looks overwhelming. That's why I wanted to give you a break from like after lecture one, go and, and, and write your own classes and then you'll like, it comes eventually so initially it looks like overwhelming but that's normal yeah so all good questions please keep asking because i know that this lecture is not that straightforward as the other ones have been before okay so this is self x0 y0 totally up to you what do you want to define them as uh, there is no restriction why i'm using x and y because like the convention usually for two dimensional points is x and y and you will see that we will use this x and y throughout in the class a lot so I just wanted to have something convenient instead of having like X0, Y0. Uh, all right, so let's see how it has created a, like a difference here. What difference has it created? Did I create? Yes. Uh, okay, so here, uh, if I'm creating this instance again, uh, it is giving me this uh, error. And of course you've seen this error with when working with functions. So it is missing two arguments, which it's expecting of course. So the initialization values for my X and my Y, right? So I have to provide that, which is excellent. I can provide that, right? And now let's check. Yes, I can create an instance of my class. Another important thing here is that if I'm not providing these arguments at some point, right? And let's say for any default point that is created, you want some default value. Let's say anybody who creates your point 2D object type, right? Uh, you always want that that like if, if the person is not giving you any input values, it should have some initial values. Let's say the point is the origin. So you can definitely do that by giving this like value here. So you can say x0 equals zero and y0 equals zero. So this does not mean that it's restricting us from giving it new values. Let me show you this. But this in turn means that if somebody is not giving these values, still this will be created because it has some initial values. And that's what this like uh, init method does, right? It's just like initializing your variables. And so you can do anything you would like to do here uh, with your initialization uh, values. So for instance, like if the parameters were not provided, I still want that like a point at the origin gets created. So one way of dealing with that is this. And we'll see like going forward, sometimes you want to put restrictions on your variables. For example, you don't want that anybody provides like some, uh, I don't know, string type uh, here instead of a numeric type. So there are ways to deal with that as well. You can like explicitly say int of this or int of this. So it converts to integer all the time. So all those are possible in the init construct or it's also known as the initializer. And this is a special method. Always remember this is the way to uh, define it, right? Just like two um, underscores, init underscores, and then the first parameter is always self because self is referring to the object itself, right? Because think about it, like internally it's saying my point 2D object has X and Y variables, and those variables will get some values. That's all this is telling us. And we can have like more input parameters here, depending on whatever our problem is, sorry, Y and Z and so on. All we'll have to do is initialize them here by saying self.z equals this, self. Uh, I don't know what equals that, right? And so on. 
Uh, okay, so here, let me go back and see if I missed anything. Yeah, so we talked about like the notation part, right? Which means like this underscore is important because it's telling us it's a special method. It was inherited right from your original object type. All right, so we did the initialization. The next thing that we want to do is like, we want to add some procedural attributes, some methods, right? And so again, I'm gonna talk about the methods here. So methods can be both special and sometimes they can be some methods that you want in your code or in your class. For example, I want my class to have a method such that when I do like a P dot that method, right? It should be able to compute the distance of my X, Y point from, from my origin, right? So that's one method that I might want, or maybe I want a method that, that utilizes 2.2D type objects and calculates the distance between those two points, right? So let's add that functionality as like my procedural attributes. And if you're adding like your own functionality in your class, then you don't have to specify the underscores because you can just like give your own name to your um, class. For example, in my case, I'm giving it magnitude because this is going to compute the magnitude of the point from the origin, which means like the distance from the origin is, is what we are calling magnitude, right? Uh, okay, so think about it. If, we, if I'm trying to calculate the distance of, uh, let me show you what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so here I'm trying to calculate, let's say the distance of like P was, let's say this five and 10, right? And I want to find the magnitude of this, which essentially means I'm trying to find the distance from zero and zero, right? So the magnitude of this is going to be the square root and then uh, five squared plus 10 squared, correct? So how many instances of my class do I need when I am calculating this magnitude? How many instances do I need here? I just need one point, right? Because I'm calculating the magnitude, which essentially tells me that calculate the distance from the origin, which is nothing but like x squared plus y squared. So I just like need a one uh, instance of my class and that's what I'm telling this to do. So basically I'm saying like, pass the object itself into this magnitude. And why is this important? Because now I'll be using my X and Y's that I created in my init method. So until and unless you have those variables initialized in your init method, you cannot use them in other functions. So here I will be using them in, a, like, in other functions as well, right? And this is to do like, of course, you can cre create your own local variables and all of that. That is totally allowed here. I, what I'm talking about is if I want to refer to the instance variables and do something with them, then I have to like initialize them. Let me show you what I mean. So here I just want to return what I said, x squared plus y squared, right? So I'll just do sqrt uh, and then self dot x. This is how you will internally refer to the variables that you've created, right? Because you're saying I need this one instance uh, of my class, which is self, and then getting the attribute x from there and squaring that, right? square plus self dot y and then square that. And I will just show you why this is so important to like have this instance of your class passed here. And that's important because sometimes in some problems you might need two instances of the same class. All right, so that kind of uh, rings a bell. Like what type of problems do we need two instances of the same class? Well, we have seen such problems before. For example, uh, let me think about it. For example, in sets, right? In sets, you've seen uh, some like set one has like one, two, three, uh, right? So this is like my set one. And my set two, let's say is, I don't know, three, four, five, right? So basically I've created two instances of set, of type set, right? And let's say I wanted to do S1 minus S2. Right? So in operations like these, or let's say I want to do S1 and S2. In all these operations, when we are doing these kind of like functionalities or methods on, on any object, I need two instances of this class. And maybe it's like in some other uh, method, I might need three instances of the class. So basically internally, these methods have to be defined uh, 
depending on what is the functionality that I'm trying to add to my class. So let me add this functionality where I'm trying to find the, mag, uh, the distance between two points. Okay, so that tells us that when I'm trying to find the distance between two points, just having like a P is not enough because like I'll have like a P, let's say four, five, right? I'll also have a Q because I'm trying to find the distance between two points, right? I'll have a Q that will have like uh, some five, six, and then I can find the distance between them. So I have to represent that internally correctly. So let me do that. So I'm saying DEF and let's call this method dist. Totally up to you, whatever functionality you're adding, you can name it anything. Uh, DEF dist and what should I add? Self first instance. For the second instance, you can use any variable name. The convention though is to use other or simply O. This is the convention. There is nothing wrong by like if you're using like F or, or, or Z, That's there's nothing wrong in that. But you can use like usually the convention is O or other because you usually say self is first instance and O is the other instance. Okay, so how is it like useful here? So I'll say return uh, is square root, right? Now I need both like the X from self, which is like P here, right? And X from Q. Right? So how do I internally represent it? Well, I'll internally represent it something like this. I'll say self dot x, right? Minus uh, o dot x, and this has to be squared now, right? Because earlier we didn't, oops, right? Plus, similar to for y, right? So I'll just say self dot y, right? Uh, minus o dot y, and then some just like square it. Right. Okay, great. So let's like, so we have created two functions, uh, magnitude and distance, and we have initialized our variables. So this point 2D class is like ready to be used. And so let's see what, like how we can use it. What are different ways of like using uh, these methods, right? So because like we have created it, of course, but the whole point of like creating them is to like uh, really utilize them in some way. Right, so let me uh, do this first. Let's say I'm using this uh, length variable and assigning to it the distance of point P uh, from the origin, which is like the magnitude essentially. So there are different ways of doing it. Step one, of course, you have to create instance of your class that we already have. Let me see if I have. Okay, now we have, right? Now, just like you've been using string methods, list methods, all of those, right? You can use your own methods. Now, the moment you do a P dot, you can see these methods coming up, the ones that you created yourself, right? So now I can use magnitude, right? And notice now, like in terms of like, what should be the parameters here? So if like internally in my class, I only have self there and no other parameter, that means here it does not require any parameter because I already have the P defined here, right? I'm saying P dot magnitude, right? And I have this and let's say I'll say print length right so let's see what is the length for this one okay so whatever this is maybe we should have rounded it here this is a huge number but regardless we know that our method is working right and this is not just like the only way of, of getting this uh, we can also directly say point to d right whatever it is and then do a dot magnitude q or a dot magnitude p it will work that way as well it's just like signifying that this is part of the point 2D class. But that's like an alternate way because we are so much used to using this kind of, uh, I would say, syntax. Let's stick with that, right? The other alternate syntax I think is given here. Uh, yeah, here. So this is just like telling us that, that this is what it meant. It meant I'm calling this class point 2D and then the function in that and passing Q in it. This is what this internally means. And we understand this as well from our knowledge of modules and functions. So like, think of this as like some uh, higher representation of a module and this is a function in that module. This is, this is how we used it, right? But now here we have created an instance and we have created an, our, our own object. So let's like stick to the notation of methods that we have been using until now, right? Okay, let's look at the other uh, method that we needed. And here in this method, we needed two, uh, instances of my class. So the first instance, of course, is P, right? Second instance is Q. And let's try to use that uh, instance. 
uh, sorry let's let's try to use that method right so if i do a p dot right and this is the method right and the moment i have this uh, parentheses here it's going to show me that it requires arguments and why is it doing that it didn't do that for magnitude but it's doing it here because i require this extra whatever that is right parameter there which in my case is q right again think of this as uh, saying 0.2d dot dist and then the parameters in that would be p and q it's the same thing as as that right and so what we're doing here is like you can simply go ahead and print it so p is mapping to self here and q is mapping to o here right again i'm like repeating it could have been like 0.2d dot dist and in parentheses like uh, p and q right so that's that's what we're doing here so once you have this you can like go ahead and like print it in whatever format you would like to print it here because it's returning this uh, value this function so of course we'll get that and of course like another uh, way of dealing with this output is that either you had some round thing here where you rounded it up to like whatever decimal places we wanted or you can have the print deal with that right so there, there's this example nice example here here where we are dealing in the print statement with that right so just like format it up to 2 uh, f and notice like i'm using those variables here directly so that's that's also something that's uh, doable uh, of course in terms of uh let me see if i missed anything well yeah in terms of self right as i said it, it's not technically special in python but in uh, like it's a good convention to use that throughout in your class because your class refers to the instance any given instance of your uh, class using the word self right and so that's why we are using it throughout okay a better i would say okay i think i have provided the point 2d uh, file already right i think this lecture files dot zip will be required in the next lecture so i'll provide that lecture 19 zip it should have been but today you just require this point 2d class which i've already provided in uh, on under the lecture notes folder on submit so you can uh, go and get it from there but regardless what we'll do is we'll, we'll do the lecture exercises together today because classes is something that is i would say really overwhelming initially so let's look at the lecture exercises uh not this one it's lecture 18 right uh, okay here so you can start with the point 2d file that was given to you right so i will just like build these methods in my uh like this thing here uh, itself and then maybe we can get the the testing uh like code from there so let's first build the methods right okay so the first method that we have to write is called scale right and scale takes as an input a point to the object self obviously we know that how to do it and then a numerical value it could be an integer or a float and multiplies both x and y attributes by this value uh, okay so let's try doing that so it's called scale which obviously takes the problem itself is telling us it takes self and then some integer or floating point and then notice it's saying that the attributes the data attributes of my uh, object should be updated so is that the question multiplies x and y attributes so i have to multiply my attributes directly and so i have to refer to them as well here right so i'm going to refer to them by saying self dot x times uh, equals s so i'm not creating a new variable here but because it's saying uh, go and update the attribute values right so i'm like directly going and updating them that's all i'm doing so self dot y times equals s right because here i'm directly referring whenever i'm saying self dot x i'm essentially referring to my uh, variables and this will update uh, my variables because i'm like directly assigning them to this right uh, all right what is the second thing asking us to do it's saying write a new method called dominates okay that takes two point two d objects so what like we know what to do when we are asked to like pass two point two d objects right the first one is going to be self the other one is going to be other right and then it returns true if and only if the x coordinates of the first object is greater than that of the second object and the y coordinates of the first object is greater than that of the second object 
Okay, so that sounds okay to me, right? We just have a single return statement, I think. So def dominates self and other, right? Because we know, need two instances of point 2D and then just like have this uh, single uh, logical self dot x greater than uh, o dot x, right? And let me put spaces so that we can clearly read it. And uh, cell dot y, right, is greater than o dot y, right? So this is all this is asking us to do. And then in, in the last part, it will just like simply ask you to go and comment out uh, the code, which you can do that like yourself. So I will leave part three to like for yourself, just like go and uncomment uh, part one. I think I have that code here. Uh, exercise one tests. So maybe we can have this here. And did we do scale and other things? I think so. So maybe we can add them here. And then just like go and run it. That's all this is asking us to do. Right, let me remove all of this here. We don't need it, right? So ex all we have to do is like go and save this file somehow and just like run these tests here. So if, if like everything goes fine, then you should be able to run this part at least. And so we are able to run that. Uh, what exactly is happening in here? We are checking uh, if we scale our point P by three, is like scaling having an effect on that point or not? So what is point P? It's zero and four. So of course it becomes zero and 12. So yes, it is like having the effect of scaling. And then in case of dominates, you can go and check whether P dominates R or not, that's false. So of course it does not. So go and check what P and R are, right? And what P and Q is and what R and uh, P are, and then like check whether we are getting the right result or not, but most likely we are. Uh, all right, so that was exercise uh, one, right? Uh, if we'll come to the second question in some time. I think we need to finish a few things, especially like these special uh, methods. And this is like an extremely important part of today's lecture. So I'd like want everybody to pay a lot of attention here. Uh, all right, let me see if uh, we can, I, I'll just like take the questions first. Uh, Caesar, you're saying, can you do the integer restriction? Where do you want to do the integer restriction right now? I think we are already getting like the, the numbers as integers. So I would like say, do not get into that. We will talk about it in the next lecture, of course. Uh, uh, Sion, you're saying what an attribute is. An attribute are, is, is something that defines your object. For example, in our example, X and Y are attributes, data attributes. Uh, Caesar, you're saying the return method doesn't have to return anything. The problem didn't ask me to return anything, right? It just, it's just saying scale, the X and Y and change them. So that's exactly what we are doing. Just like go and change your X and Y. And that would have changed the definition of my point itself. That's what happened here, right? Notice this one, this example here. I said, I have created a point that has like X and Y zero and four, and then I scaled it by three and I got this new point, right? I got this, this new point that is like zero and 12, right? So I don't have to return anything because the problem didn't ask me to return anything. Uh, Kiran, you're saying, can you quickly go back to the exercise? The exercise is right in front of you, but I would like uh, move on. I wouldn't like keep doing this because we will build on this only. So you will get a lot of chance to like look at it because the other part is like even more important. Uh, all right, so going back to some of the objects that we know about, right? For example, uh, you know about integer types, right? So if I just like go and create this x equals five and y equals 10, right? Uh, and if I do something like this, x plus y, right? I, I didn't have to do anything, but it just like understands that this like plus operator has to go and add these values, right? Now, if I again go and create this x, equals this, right? And y equals uh, this. Uh, and, and then do like an x plus y, right? My plus operator knows that it has to go and concatenate these values, 
right so there is this like magical thing with my plus operator that is object dependent right so basically depending on the object type that we have created let's say this was a list then again it would have concatenated them right but if this was a float here it would have added them right similar to the subtraction sign like remember the sets object type subtract meant something different from what i would have done here when i say x minus y right so these are like existing operators that have some special meaning but that meaning changes as we work with different object types right and so that's what we are looking at here in this section now i have like this p and q right let me show you what i mean right and i want to do these like operations on this so let's say i create it here again going back here and it's okay i'll remove it later on so I, I have created this like point 2d which is like p and then q right and then i want to like add them so let me do that right so this gives me this type error so it's telling me that this is unsupported operand type plus so basically my like internally it does not know how to deal with these types when we are using this plus operator right or when i'm using this like minus operator doesn't know how to deal with it or how to do, deal with this like negative sign uh, added to one of these uh, values right so so basically i have to come up with something that also internally tells python that this is the meaning of this operator when you're working with this object type right and so that's exactly what we're going to do now so i'm going to i want that whenever somebody creates p and q right I should be able to add p and q such that x get, gets added to x in my like p and q right for example if my p and q are these and i'm i'm saying p plus q my result should be 5 and 14 and it's up to me like how do i want the points to be added it totally depends on me because i have all this flexibility to add that functionality to my class so it's up to me like maybe you could you could decide that um p plus q means 4 plus 5 and 0 plus 10 totally depends on like how you're creating your class so i decided that my add means zero should be added to five and four uh, should be added to ten so how do we add it in my class well again we will use this special method uh, let me show you and that already is inherited oops that is already inherited from my object class and should be here uh, Okay, I'm somehow not able to see that. But regardless, if you do a help on P, we'll get the list of all the methods that are already there. But we don't have to kind of uh, worry about that. These are the special methods that can be implemented to sort of get what we want to get. So for example, this underscore, underscore, add, underscore, underscore internally means that I will be using the add or the plus operator. So similar to that, if I have like underscore underscore sub, it internally means I'll be using the subtraction operator and this is what it should do. And this means I'll be using this like negative operator or the negative sign with the object and this is what it should do, right? So let's actually go and add this there and let me show you how we do that. So I'll just like add this and because it's a special method, we need this underscore now. Why is this a special method? Because the same addition sign is used with other Python objects that, that has a different meaning. Right, so that's why what will happen is, and this is also known as like operator overload in the sense that uh, this operator will be overloaded with the functionality of my class here, right? It wouldn't have uh, the existing functionality as such. I'm like overloading it uh, with my own functionality and this is how I want my operator to behave when, I, when I'm using my class. All right, so I'm using this add and as always, I need self and other right and what should it return as i said i wanted to return like the sum of um, x and y right and also also one more important thing as i'm writing this now I'm remembering uh, also uh, when we are doing this x plus y the 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 result of this is also of a type right and usually it takes the type of x and y right and in this case, for example, when I did a concatenation, it, the, the concatenated string is of the type string, right? So the, the same logic applies here. Like when I'm returning something, when I've added like point 2D, like P and Q, that also has to be a point 2D type, 
right? So that's why when we return these type of uh, operators, essentially, we'll say it's point to D. And of course, we have to give the first argument and the second argument, which in this case is going to be self dot X uh, plus O dot X, because this is how I decided that my operator should work, right? And self dot Y plus O dot Y. All right, so this is the addition operator. Similar to that, I can add the subtraction, the equal to, uh, the not equal to. So all of them are here. Uh, let me show you. And of course, this is equivalent to saying that I will be calling point to D dot add and whatever it is, right? So this is like the same thing that like we, we are familiar with when we are working with modules and functions. So again, we know this, but now I can do a P plus Q. So similar to that, I can do a P a minus Q if I add the subtract method, right? And we can also define certain Boolean operators. For example, equal to, not equal to, uh, let me show you. So this is like the equal to, and this is like the not equal to. I think we'll add a few of them when we are working with the um, lecture exercises. So I'll, I'll go and add some of them there. For example, I'll add the equal to, and I'll leave the not equal to to you to add that. And so, uh, all right. And one more important thing is the str method. Okay, let me show you why we need this str method. And let, then after that, we'll add all of these uh, methods together. So let me first create this class and show you what I mean. Okay, so this is created. And we said that like my add method can add point P and Q, right? So I'm going to do print P plus Q, right? And let me, like, P is created, Q is created, and so I'm saying, like, go and print P and Q. Okay, so this gives me this, like, weird output, right? What exactly is this output? Well, this is referring to the memory location of your point 2D object. This is not what you want, right? You want that this should print, like, this, like, 5, 14. Right, and this is giving you some like location, which is like weird. So we don't want that. Uh, well, why is that happening? Like, have we ever tried to uh, print P yet? Let me try doing that. Well, that is also giving me some memory location somewhere, which is of absolutely no use to me, right? It doesn't make any sense. And why is, it, is, is this thing happening? Well, we have defined everything in our class, like, this should be the functionality, this should be the representation, but we haven't defined the method that will obtain the standard output when we are printing the object. And this is important because every object that you create and when you want to print it, you have to specify how it should be printed, which we haven't done yet. And how do we do that? We do that using this str method. Right? So this is what this is talking about. This str method here, will implement that, the underscore underscore str. Now, in like recent times, there is another method that has been added that's like the, oh, let me write it down. Uh, okay. So there are two options that you have, like so the first one, and I'm going to use this one because we mostly use this one, is the str method. The other one that you can use, uh, like alternately, whichever you like, is the representation method or the REPR method. In both cases, you have to return a string type that will represent your object when you, you're using a print on, on, on your object. Let me show you what, uh, how, right? So let me add this, and I think uh, the lecture exercise asks us to do that. I'm not sure, let's see. Yeah, that's the first uh, part, so let's do that, right? And that's important also because we're not able to print it, right? So the way to do that is underscore, underscore, str, underscore, and the uh, like the first object that will take is of course one instance of your class because until and unless you have that there is no point so self right now here is the thing you can decide how you want your print to be executed depending on what type of object you have right so let's see if they have specified anything here uh, write and test the implementation returns a string created from the values of point to the object so this like you can uh, print your uh, object type as something like this. Whenever you do a print on let's say P, right? 
it it can give like x space y right or it can give x comma y or it can give x comma y within parentheses it's up to us how we want to represent it and all we have to do is using these x and y's i have to create a string that looks like that that's all i have to do so i'm thinking let me print the parentheses because that looks like more uh, logical so all i have to do is and it's like simple because it is a string so i'm going to return a string so the string is going to be like a tuple it looks like a tuple of course with commas in there and as i said it's up to you with what what string you want to return i want to return this so dot format and then it has to be like in parentheses x and y so that's why it will refer to self uh, dot x right comma self dot y uh, and that's it right so this is how i want to represent as i said you can return any other string and that's absolutely fine so now we have a string method and if i do a print p now oops i have to create it again So now it prints the way I want to uh, print it, right? Because I specified in my string method that this is how I want the standard output to look like when I'm working with my uh, point 2D object, right? So I'll just remove these two statements here because now I know how to print them. All right, coming to these special functions, I think we have more. Uh, for example, the equal to and the not equal to. So these are like special functions. Why? Because they are representing these operators that we've been using until now. Right, so these can be implemented by using this equal to and the not equal to, right? Uh, let's actually implement all of them. Let me look at the question. So write the implementation of the subtraction method, uh, multiplication, and equal to. So let's let's like actually go and do that, right? So let me add the next one, which is subtraction. And in the end, I'll uh, implement the equal to so that we understand what we are doing. Subtraction is very similar to uh, your addition, right? So all I have to do is underscore sub and then self, and we will need another instance because otherwise subtraction doesn't mean anything, all uh, right? And what do we want to return in subtraction? We just want to return a point 2D object with the X and the Y subtracted, right? So point 2D, and I will just like copy this and instead of like addition have subtraction, right? So minus and minus. Uh, all right, let me see questions. I totally forgot. Uh, Caesar, you're saying should the output method be the last method defined? It does not. Uh, no, it does not matter. The sequence doesn't matter. You can have like in any way. The convention usually is to always have the init method at the top because it's like saying that this is where you define your data attributes. But like honestly, it doesn't really matter. Wherever you want, you can do it. Yeah, the sequence doesn't matter here. Okay, so going back, this is the subtraction method. The next method it's asking us to implement is the multiplication method, but it, there's a slight twist in the multiplication method here. It's saying write the implementation of the method multiplication, which is like the scale function, but it creates a new point 2D object. Okay, so in the scale function, we were updating my X and Y, but here I don't want to like, update the x and y but just like create a new point 2d object so that's like even simpler than the scale so define and so now notice notice now when i'm using this underscore underscore multiplication underscore and i'm using the star sign for multiplication for my point 2d object this is what it will mean you cannot just assume that this means multiplying two point 2d objects it means multiplying a point 2d object with some uh like some number because that's how i'm defining my mul uh method here okay self multiply by some scalar or like essentially a number right and instead of like updating my uh self x and self y just like we did with scale i have to return a point 2d method right so i'll just like copy this again with slight updates of course Right, so this is telling us that this is what multiplication means for my point 2D, except that here I need it to be multiplied by S. And here I need it to be multiplied by S. But also notice that this point 2D object always requires these two 
parameters. So that's something that we should be providing it, right? And then let's go back and see, yeah, the implementation of the equal method. And what does equal means for our point 2D objects? Well, it should return a true if and only if the two objects have exactly the same X and the, the Y's. So, well, this tells you what you need to do. You already are familiar with this logic. So let me just like demonstrate how do we do that. So whenever the two equal to signs will be used with your point 2D objects, this is what they will mean, right? So here, self, just like we did with others, because you need two instances to compare, of course. And then just like return self dot x equals equals o dot x, right? And so th this has to return a true or a false. So that's why I'm just like writing a statement, a logical statement dot y. And I think that's it, right? All right. So what does it exactly ask us to do in terms of like testing? Yeah, so again, we need the code that's like, I already provided that to you. So I'm just like going to copy it from here. So here it's testing the STR test and I'll show you a slight, a small, uh, I would say intricacy of this. Let me just first copy this. Uh, all right, so the first test here is to check whether the subtraction method is working fine. And uh, yeah. The subtraction method is working fine and here we are printing p and r and you must have noticed like why in the tests we have like this str uh, attached to your p right now p if we print it directly of course it's printing this tuple here right but this is of the type point 2d and we haven't specified what happens when we concatenate that point or that type right this output with another string Right? And so if we wanted to do that, I'm explicitly converting it to a string type, which is easy. Why? Because internally, this is a string type, right? But just because like externally for the, the standard output, it is a point 2D type object. So I cannot directly concatenate it. So that's why we are using this STR everywhere, which might seem a little weird, but actually it's not, right? So let me just like run it here because uh, this already exists. So let's like run this here, no cancel. Right, so these tests should most likely pass if you were following uh, what I was writing. Uh, essentially, when, when we like go back to the tests, important thing to notice was this STR, uh, of course, because we know that we, we cannot concatenate with a string type without that. The other thing to notice is this multiplication. And so the multiplication uh, requires that we provide this S, right? Because in the multiplication method, we said it requires an instance of my class and also a number that's S. So that's what uh, is happening here. And then here we are testing the equal to. I would encourage, although it's not required for the lecture exercises, to go and add the not equal to method as well and, and, and see how it works. So this is how we write it. It's like underscore, underscore, NE. NE is for not equal to. And of course, you can, it, it's, you're totally free to define how it should work for your class. That's the flexibility that you have right now. Uh, okay. So that was like an introduction to classes today. I, what we did here was that uh, we created a class uh, which is like a type in Python and we created certain like data attributes and procedural attributes and then tested them. Now think of like any class as a part of a module because we are going to do that going forward. So one script or one like file will not have a single class but you can have like multiple classes or multiple classes distributed across different modules and you will be calling them one from another. And that's the example that we look at in uh, lecture 19. So this is what this is talking about, right? It's saying that each class is generally put into its own a module or like many closely related classes, right? And then we, we work with them. And so that's like the general convention of, of, of using that, right? And we will demonstrate that. Next time I will demonstrate that because we will be creating a restaurant class and we will, using, we will be using this point 2D class there. So I would say we'll demonstrate that next time. Of course, the material has been already posted, all right? I think we already finished this lecture exercise already, so I wouldn't like uh, worry too much about that. The other thing is when to modify and when to create a new object. Some methods, for example, we saw two different methods. The scale method was updating, 
right? The object itself, right? We didn't we didn't have a return value. All it did was it took a parameter and updated my x and y. And then we had this multiplication method that was creating a new object. So when you are creating your class, it's important that you identify the semantics of each method, which means the behavior of each method. That is important when you're like, because like one of the homework, the last homework will give you a lot of flexibility in creating your own classes. So it's it will be up to you on how you will design your methods to achieve what you want to achieve, right? So make sure that you understand what each method does and how should we be using them, right? Uh, some of the important conventions before I'll show you the time example. Never create attributes outside the class. If they belong to that class, always have them in the, in, and, and I would say like even more so have them in the initializer, initializer always, if they are the data attributes for your object. Sometimes you might need some local variables for a particular method. That's fine, you can have them here. That's absolutely fine, but the data attributes should always be in your init class, or init method rather. Uh, what else? Don't directly access or change attributes except through class methods. Yeah, so don't do direct assignment because uh, it might create issues if you're calling your class somewhere else. So it might get like some updated values that will like mess uh, with your code. So these are some of the conventions. And of course, we will keep talking about conventions in lecture 19 when we like dig deeper into how to have like multiple classes interact with one another. Uh, one example that has been posted on uh, the course website, and let me show you. If you go to code written in class and then lecture 18 here, so here we wanted to create a time class, basically an object that represents time, right? And time is usually, it's again, it's up to you how you will want to like represent time, mostly in hours, minutes, and seconds, right? So that's what the uh, initial attri data attributes are for this. But there is, an, 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 and of course, like we are doing, uh, we're converting internally everything to seconds because we want to add certain methods that will utilize seconds directly. And then in the STR method, we're we are converting it back to hours, minutes, and seconds because that's how we want it to be represented. So there are two uh, variations of this problem that have been posted. The first one is here. The other one is here. They are doing the exact same thing. The only difference is it's up to me how I want to handle my time internally. Right, so here I'm, I'm handling it as like keeping it separate as hours, minutes, and seconds in a list, right? All I did was like I have this variable self dot time internally, and then I'm like just uh, putting them in a list. Here I have self dot seconds, and I have converted everything to seconds, and both of them achieve the exact same thing. We are able to uh, add time, we are able to subtract time. And so what they are demonstrating here, both of them, is that there could be multiple ways of achieving the same result Result by like, it, it's totally up to you how you want to represent it internally and how you want to use it in the rest of your methods, right? Because here maybe it became convenient for me to convert everything to seconds and then use it. So I'm like, notice I'm referring everything to seconds and then using it. Here I created a list of hours, minutes, and seconds, and then indexing that list uh, to get uh, whatever I want to get in terms of adding and subtracting. So my recommendation is please go through each of them and maybe if you can come up with your own time class, that's absolutely fine. That would give you like enough uh, practice in terms of getting started with like write, writing classes because as I said, like uh, the last homework, homework eight is all about like writing classes and how classes interact with one another. So that is like lecture 19, how classes interact. But I think you have all the necessary tools to go and create your own class. So that's something that you should do after going through like this point 2D example, of course, and then this time example as well. Uh, let me quickly see if there is anything else before we end. So of course, in summary, we now know how to create Python classes, right? And classes always remember will have attributes and methods. Sometimes combined, like combined, they're known as attributes, right? So these are data attributes, these are procedural attributes. And then remember, this is something that's always required. This is the best convention to initialize your variables and, and create your method. And we, of course, looked at point 2D and time example. As I said, please jump back to the time example and uh, try to understand how we've created that. So that's it. That's all from my end. Uh, just a quick reminder, there's no lecture on Thursday and there's no lab this week.
So that's it from my end. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining. And if you have questions, you can stay back. If not, then free to leave. And let me see if there are questions that I forgot. Uh, see you on, yes, homework is due Thursday. Yes. Uh, Rochelle, I didn't see your question. How do you add without it telling you the memory? Uh, I'm not 100% sure if I'm getting your question right. Which memory are you talking about? Okay, let me show you what I meant when I was doing add. And I think Caesar, your question was similar to that one. So let's go back to and see what adding means, right? So I would always like, that's why I refer to this example all the time. When you add like two integers, what happens? When you're adding two integers, essentially you're saying create another integer. Right. When you're adding two strings, you're essentially saying go and create another string. Right. And so if you don't do that here, uh, when we are using this add and subtract, if you don't specify that here, then this add doesn't make a lot of sense because like basically you, you want to do P plus Q uh, as a new object, which is of the type point to D. And that's why we are doing that in like add, subtract, uh, multiplication and so on. However, if you decide that like the plus sign should mean something else, the plus sign should mean some X and Y being the output and not the point to the object itself, then it's up to you. If you want like your the plus sign to behave in, in, in that manner. But the convention usually is to have the same object because that's what addition means, right? What does addition mean when I'm, I'm using two floating points or two integers or two lists or two tuples? It means that I'm creating another object of the same type and even like with sets. So I think that should be uh, clear. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs>